poll panelists and attendees, if you can hear me clearly. I'm gonna end polling. Thank you for that. And we are off. So microbit in a nutshell, what is a microbit? Why is it important and why is it interesting? So a microbit is a microcontroller. A microcontroller is basically a very, very small programmable device, almost like a computer on a microchip. And it's the first microcontroller ever designed to be programmed by high school students. So typically this is something uh, that electronics engineers use in the real world to automate things. And the previous most popular microcontroller, which most of you probably heard about, um, Arduino. Well, Arduino was designed to be programmed by design university students. We're not exactly techies, but Microbit is basically the new gold standard on microcontrollers that are easy to program. It can be programmed by JavaScript, MakeCode, and Python. Now, MakeCode is a block language that fairly, that's fairly easy to use. And you know, it can really go down to the level of sort of upper primary children. Um, another really cool feature, it's a microcontroller that's very capable of radio communication. And this typically, you know, if you're typing Python, it's one line of code, if you're using blocks, we're talking about two blocks, one to set the channel and another to send the message. Now radio communication typically in microcontrollers is actually quite a challenge. Um, it most importantly, if you are in a school educational institution, if your uh, kids are maybe, or if you're using a computer uh, with limited usage, usage rights or like a Chromebook, uh, a microbit doesn't require any installed IDE. It doesn't require any drivers. It doesn't require any admin permissions. It's essentially like a USB that you drop programs into and it just works. Better than that, there's emulators for both Python and MakeCode. Now, oh, one last thing. Yes, it runs on these uh, AA batteries and these last for weeks. So in my house in, in winter, I typically have a microbit just showing the temperature and I need to change batteries on it maybe every three weeks, so yeah. It's pretty neat. Now, here are some specs for techie people. Uh, it has a uh, processor that's 16 megahertz, 256K flash, and 32-bit. Now, 256K flash, that's got like less than a megabyte of memory. 16 megahertz, like if you got a decent PC uh, like myself, you've probably got something like four gigahertz, eight cores, and whatnot. Um, so this is about a thousand times less than a fancy PC but it's still incredibly computationally powerful if you think about what 16 megahertz 32-bit means. 32-bit is an inside integer of something like up to two trillion. And if you can imagine 16 million times a second doing maths operations with numbers up to two trillion, that's how much computing power a microbit has. And still that's a thousand times less than your computer. It uses Wi-Fi. Um, essentially the same frequencies as your Wi-Fi modem, but what's really fancy and cool about it is that it's been abstracted down to just a couple functions that send and receive information. It has these built-in push buttons, and these guys basically, yeah, they're like installed buttons that you can read and access their inputs. It's got this five by five uh, display grid. The LED grid is, um, it's basically all red. It's all one color. And, oops, I was on YouTube for a second. It's got this three axis accelerometer, which is what we're gonna be using today a lot. So this program I've got running on it right now has this like dot that tilts with the accelerometer. So the accelerometer basically measures forces in the entire three dimensional space. And it can use that to sense shakes, tilts, as well as like essentially as a control device, uh, perhaps with other microbits. So yeah, there's a built-in temperature sensor that is a part of the processor, as well as you've got these 19 assignable GPIO pins. And where these come in handy is you could break out a microbit into a breadboard, or quite often a lot of people uh, use it as like a robot brain. So you will probably have noticed there's a lot of robots where you essentially plug in the microbit like a cartridge and the microbit acts as a, um, the brain of that robot. And this is where the fact that it's very easy to send uh, information through wireless 
can be used because one micro bit can control another, which is plugged into a robot. So you have this remote control done via two micro bits. Okay, so in terms of why learn how to program this particular computer that is a thousand times slower and has a million times less memory than this big computer I'm sitting at or the laptop you're with, there's plenty of good reasons. And number one is that it actually offers interaction with the real world. On a PC, uh, most programs actually have to create a whole world simulation and then interact with that simulation. So to do something significant takes a lot of code. Whereas a micro bit, you know, it can sense uh, through sensors, you can sense sound, light, touch, moisture, pH. So it can be used almost like a scientific instrument. Mm -hmm. And you have options to attach output devices like LEDs, servos, motors, and with sufficient number of say servos and motors, you could basically control a robot. So there is a whole host of much more, I don't know, real world interactions that Microbit makes possible. Now, in terms of creating programs that do something useful, it is again, way easier to do this on a Microbit than to do it on a traditional you know, computer system because right there, that is actually an alarm system. This alarm system reads a reading from a PIR sensor and it sends that reading to another micro bit. So a wireless alarm system is something that you might imagine is fairly complicated, but you can make that in you know, 10, 15 blocks. And this is, the, um, this is the thermometer that you can install in your room, which takes about four lines of code, actually three lines if you don't count the space. So it's very easy to do something useful. But perhaps most interesting is what the programming of microcontrollers is going to look like in the future. So currently in 2020, we are on schedule to have 31 billion devices similar to this one that are connected to the internet. Currently, this doesn't, you know, today have huge major implications, but it's made automating uh, intelligent systems in our surroundings a lot easier. And I'll give you two examples of projects that are currently in research phases that are going to change the way that we live. So in Australia, for instance, um, you know, these are really relevant to us. We've had the worst bushfires in probably hundreds of years, just three, four months ago. So, um, there's a system currently in development funded by an insurance company, which kind of makes sense if you think about it, of a distributed fire alarm system. So throughout sort of country cities where you have a high danger of bushfires, there are these sensors that are attached, attached usually to somewhere close to the power grid for their power supply that send smoke and they send wireless signals to each other and as these sensors get triggered, basically the firefighters would not only know that there's a fire happening, they would know how far it has spread, where it is on the map, and it'll give them real-time information that really, really helps preventing a disaster that we've just gone through. Um, I don't know if this is true where you live, but here in Melbourne, ambulances are actually taking extreme risks on a daily basis. They break all the road rules. They, they drive sort of on sides of roads, past the speed limits through red lights in order to try to get their sick patients to the emergency room really quickly. With uh, an internet of things system where microcontrollers uh, talk to each other, microcontrollers already operate traffic lights. They could simply uh, collectively make a decision uh, to let the ambulance through. And so the ambulance is just going to get a series of green lights, get to the hospital a whole lot more safely than having to try to run lights. So these are basically uh, just two examples of projects currently under research that are fairly, I would say, simple. Like the final implementation would not have tens of thousands of lines of code. Um, there are sort of simple implementations of microcontrollers and the internet of things. Okay, so that's the micro bit and microcontroller intro. Let's get into some very basic programs. 
So what we're going to do at the very start, I'm going to share a screen and we're going to program the following in make block. All of these are fairly straightforward. We're going to program a step counter, a button masher, and a balance gain. And as I build them, I'm going to explain how they work and give you some suggestion of what more you could do with them. Okay, just search make code micro bit. So this is the block coding interface of the BBC micro bit. After that, you will click on the very first link. You will realize you do not actually have to have an account uh, through cookies. It saves the programs you've previously created. So you can just open up a new project. All right, so now that you're there, I'm actually gonna zoom in a little bit so that you can see it. So I'll talk you through this interface a little bit. On the left side is the microbit emulator. And what's awesome about that, rather than having to put your program on a microbit, you can actually test out how it's going to work or whether it's going to work. And you could basically do your debugging without having to rely on the fact that, you know, typically in Python, you'd have error messages appearing on this guy and you'd have to wait a long time for them to appear. And it takes basically 10 to 15 seconds for programs to download. So having it instant is really, really convenient. So the very first program that I'm going to do is the step counter. And the step counter is going to take advantage of this shake event. So, not radio, input. Basically, you'll find inside input, there is this block that says on shake. And what on shake does is basically when you shake the micro bit, it can execute a series of blocks, right? So if I put a heart in there and then I play this program and then I click shake, we should be able to, one second, shake, we should be able to get the heart on the screen. So rather than getting a heart on the screen, we're actually gonna use this shake to count the number of steps. Now, what, what I've seen kids do is actually either tie this uh, micro bit in this case on their hip or actually on their shoe because the shoe act has a more predictable, strong shake. There is a way to calibrate it, which I'm gonna show you in a second, but let's program the most basic version. So we can make a variable and we're gonna call it steps. And let's put this over there. So in this variable, we're going to set it to zero at the start and we're going to change it by one on shake. And then we can display the number of steps. And there you have it. So if I was to run this, stop. Every time I shake it, the number of steps would go up by one. However, there is a certain time taken. I think it's 0.6 seconds by default to show a number. And if you're running, perhaps this is uh, going to get in the way of the step counter working accurately. So there's a special block called stop animation. You can just search stop animation. So that is going to stop the showing of, of the current state of the counter when it changes. That essentially guarantees that the shake event is listening for a new event um, as the new step is happening. So maybe for the fun of it, I'm just going to, I've got one micro bit here that is connected to, um, to a cable. So, why don't I just download and I download to the micro bit. I'm not sure if you can see uh, me browsing to it, but I've clicked save. And this time you see this blinking at the back and there it is. You shake it and the steps count. So that was, I guess the first troubleshooting um, thing. The, this micro bit was plugged in for a while um, and it didn't work when I initially put the file in it. So I just pl unplugged it, plugged it back in and off we go. Okay. So that was the very first make block program.
a step counter. If you want it to be more precise, um, there are actual uh, measures of forces, 3G, 6G, 8G, in terms of how much force you would need. You could have also created some kind of a forever if, and you can take the actual measure of forces. So for example, you could take the acceleration in any dimension being so there's a strength option, being greater than say 1100. That's like 10% more than gravity. So you can, you can do this in a very, very precise calibrated way, but I found that the sort of built-in functions do a good enough job. Okay, I can get rid of that. That program is gonna work. By the way, I have, um, I, have a, I have a set of links for the three programs that we're going to do, and I'm going to send them to you in the chat in a few minutes. But let's go on to the next one, the button masher. So the button masher, what is a button masher? Basically, we're gonna press the button a certain number of times, uh, as many times as we can, sorry. So we're going to actually set the program to give us a random signal, wait for five seconds or 10 seconds, and we're going to see how many times we can push a button. So it's like a cookie clicker style game. And I find that school kids just love this type of thing and they compete a lot with each other. Okay, so what do we need to build that one? Similar to our um, first one, we're going to need, well, a start and an event. So in the event, we are also going to be going to the input and as opposed to shake, we're gonna be checking button pressed. And last time we were counting steps and this time we're gonna be counting presses. So we're going to set them to zero and change them by one. However, we need some kind of a go signal and we need some point at which we're gonna print the number of presses. So the game is gonna last for a certain amount of time and then it's going to be over. So let's have a look at what we could do about that. So on start, we can actually have like some kind of a countdown, like three, two, one. Um, by the way, these take quite a while to print. So try to have like the shortest amount of text possible. And then we could show an image, uh, like a tick would do. Oops. So set presses to zero, there's a tick. And now we have a time limit. Pause, let's make it five seconds, 5,000, not 50, 5,000. And when you're done, you need to print out the presses. So we're gonna need to show string, and there's a special text that has like concatenation you need to join. And we can say presses, or you can say presses in five seconds or whatever. And we can put in the value of the presses. So that should be it. Um, let's test it out here and then I'll download it to my micro bit. So here we go, we're gonna press this a few times. And now it's gonna say presses. And you see how slow it is? Hence, less text, the better. 24. So you can make that, uh, you know, see how many you can do. By the way, in the chat, right now, I'll send you links to the three microbit programs. So chat, where is the chat? Good. So these three are going to have the code that I'm having on the screen. There might be some tiny variations, but you're going to be able to access them whenever. So maybe just open them in tabs and save the URLs. So what's our final one? Yes, our final one is going to use these game blocks. So Microbit has, uh, well, I should say MakeCode has these sort of built-in functions that are common in a game, sort of scoring, lives, adding life, removing life, changing scoring. And it has some animations that go with that. So that's what I'm gonna to do to create a game where the objective is to stay relatively still. So this is a, a game that 
me and a couple of colleagues came up with uh, when I was working at Kiosk Swinburne, so which is like a STEM center at a university. And we would get um, kids to come over for like day long workshops. And we had this, we had this game where we'd line up the kids and they'd have to stand on, on the toes of like one foot and hold a micro bit and stay in the air like this and try to last as long as possible until sort of the life in their micro bit ran out. And it runs out if you shake it even a little bit. So um, after the basic version of the game, we would also have a radio signal, which would send us their number when they died. And so it would be like rounds and rounds and kids would get hyper competitive with it. Okay, so let me get into the game. So what do we need? We need to uh, have like an initial and a forever. So there's a, there's a forever, there is a on start. So inside the game, there's life. So we need to take life and then set it to something. Let's set it to five. And then we need to have, you know, and this is the magic of microcontrollers, an if statement inside a forever loop uh, gets you to two interesting things. So we're gonna get this check uh, if a certain amount of force is exceeded. And this is where we're gonna use the acceleration. So if the acceleration in any direction, so strength is like any direction, and the acceleration in any direction is more than 1,100. 1,000 is gravity, right? 1,100 is 10% more than gravity. So any amount of shaking is going to trigger this. If that happens, you're going to lose a life. So we're going to remove life. We're going to remove one life. But at, otherwise, we're going to change score by one. Now, normally I put a delay here, but there's an animation that happens when you change the score by one. So that's pretty neat. And when you remove life, we don't want to lose too many lives too quickly. So we can put a little bit of a delay, like 250 milliseconds here. So we're not putting a delay in terms of gaining score. We're just putting a delay in terms of losing score. So there it is. That is a, a, a full functioning game. Maybe I'm going to just show it to you here. So you start it it's increasing the score. That X is like loss of life. So we've just lost a couple and now we've lost all the lives and it's gonna go through this really long process of saying game over and then it'll tell you the score. And from memory, score is actually gonna be high, like something in the hundreds. 309. So, there you go. And then I was going to scroll again. Um, do try this at home. And yeah, if you've got friends or kids over there, trust me, they're going to love the game. All right. So that about covers what I wanted to do for the make block tutorials. And now we're going to get into Python. So let me bring back the uh, PowerPoint. Where are you? Ah, there you are. I'll stop sharing this, share the PowerPoint. And we're going to try to, um, we're going to try to elaborate on sort of one concept that I think Microbit is particularly good at. Uh, and that is playing around with reaction time. Now, reaction time, which is uh, actually, I've got the slides here, let me define it. Reaction time is the total time taken for a human to physically react to a sensory input. Um, so that sensory input could be, you see something, you react. You hear something, you react. Or maybe like it's actually another sensation, like you touch something or you feel a certain amount of heat or all of those are sensory inputs. And it has three components really. So your brain has to process the sensory input your brain has to tell your muscles to move, and then your muscles have to execute that action. All of these take time. And what's even more interesting about it, I'm gonna show you a couple of videos, is that the performance varies a lot under different circumstances. So let's say if you're rested versus tired, if you're younger versus older, if you play video games versus you don't, if there is pressure versus no, pressure. So this is a, a YouTube clip. Um, I'm going to put a link. I might send it to you, actually, that's going to talk a little bit about the 
ruler reaction time test, which is, you know, you drop a ruler, you see how fast you can catch it. You could totally try that at home. And it has a neuroscientist talking about what's involved in the test. I really apologize. What's going on from how the brain identifies that they need to take an action to the action happening? It's a complicated process. It seems very straightforward because you're observing, you know, one act. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that there are many different processes in the brain that allow you to do that. So I'd say if you laid out all the sequences, it would be anticipation, so they're ready, maybe a motor sequence already ready to fire. Then the sensation comes in, which is just the retina picking up the information that has started moving. Then the perception, which is really an interpretation of what's happening, and that happens in the visual parts of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, the front part of your brain, is involved in the decision-making process of actually, okay, go ahead and grab it. The premotor cortex sort of defines the sequence. The motor part of your brain, which is in the middle, will then send a signal down your spinal cord, which will tell the muscles to grab. So, you know, there's a lot of processes. So this is several hundred milliseconds in order to have an action like that. You know, it almost feels like Mother Nature made us using Rube Goldberg techniques. And so what's interesting to me is that, yes, it's complicated and it improves with practice. And yet the people in the world that are the best at reaction time are arguably 100 meter sprinters because for them, records are either uh, breaking or not breaking depending on how fast they start. They either win or lose depending on how fast they start. And in 1996, which was considered to be the strongest, most unpredictable lineup of 100 meter sprinters ever, they had three consecutive false starts, which just kind of shows you how much pressure affects reaction time. Check it out. A rare false start from Christie. Famously an excellent starter, he knew he'd have to be flawless today. He pushed his luck. One more of those and his Olympic Games career would be over. Another false start. This time, young Bolden was at fault. Tension was building. Third time lucky? Christie looked bemused, but replays seemed to confirm that he was at fault. His title defense was over in heartbreaking circumstances. Okay, so I think it's uh, your turn to see how well you can do with various reaction time programs. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to actually now use MicroPython to program a basic reaction time um, device. Initially, we're gonna build a counter. And after we have the counter counting seconds, we are going to interrupt the counter with the press of a button. So we're only gonna display the count when we press the button. And then we're gonna modify that program to count hundreds of a second. And then uh, show the counter when the button is pressed. Now, together with that modification, if you have a random start, you have a complete reaction time program. So let me exit this and guide you into the best Python emulator for the BBC microbit. So let's share a screen here. And I want you to search Create with code UK. Now I'll also send you a, um, a link to this in a second. So you click create with code. And this right here is a Python emulator. It's got one thing that bothers me a lot, which is you can't really save your programs. I mean, you can copy and paste them, but on the other hand, you know, it emulates both Python and the microbit. And when you press play, you're going to see your BBC microbit and the programs it has. So let's begin. Let's begin with that counter. So what are we going to need? We're going to need to import the BBC microbit. So from microbit import star. 
And after doing that, we are going to create a counter. Counter equals to zero. So that creates an integer that is a counter. And after that, we're going to have a forever loop, which in Python is while true, right? So while like one is one, this is just going to keep going. And you are going to, in that loop, iterate the counter. Counter, you could say plus equals, or you could say counter equals to counter. Supplement counter plus one. So counter equals to counter plus one. We're going to sleep for a whole second, and then we're going to print the counter. And the printing of the counter works like this. You're going to display dot scroll, and you're going to say, I think counter would work, but string of counter is a safer bet. So that should be it. You could press play. And there it is. One, two, three, four. A very, very, um, yeah, very basic counter program. So now we're going to start the modifications, which are going to make this into a reaction time circuit. The very first um, modification is going to be an if statement that is going to check whether uh, a button is pressed, right? So we're only going to show the counter when a button is pressed. If button underscore a dot is pressed. It's a function, so you need the brackets. And to put this inside the if statement, you need to press the tab. And now you run it, and nothing happens. Well, nothing should happen. Stop it. Run it again. OK, that makes sense. Nothing is happening. But when we press button A, it's going to display the state of the counter. Six, right? So we're going to press it a few seconds later, and we're going to have what was that 10? Cool. OK, so now we're going to take that counter down to count hundreds of a second, so 10 milliseconds a count. And we also need a random signal, like a, a light that's going to come on after a random amount of time. So here we could import random. And we can now create a random delay, which is going to be sleep random dot rand int. It depends how much you want to make it. I'll just make it one to three seconds, a thousand comma three thousand. And now we could just print some big image. I like butterfly. So you could say display dot show image dot butterfly. Okay, that should work. Oh, ah, that's a horrible reaction time. Um, maybe I should just actually uh, put some, something like time. Time or T. Yeah. All right, let's test this thing again. Thirty six. That's horrible. Come on, Sony. Okay, twenty something. When I think of that, I don't know if that was twenty eight or, or twenty, but yeah, not too bad. And so you have a working reaction time circuit. So at this point, uh, guys, if you have any questions, this is a good time to send them in. I'm going to be monitoring the chat, and what we're going to be doing next is we are going to add a, um, a variable that counts, that makes us play the game three times, and then prints out the average and the best time. And this is where Python comes in handy, because we're going to use list. We're going to add our times to a list, 
and we're going to use some list functions to calculate the averages and to figure out the best time possible. Okay, so let's get started with that. So what do we need? As I said, we're going to need some kind of a, uh, a recording system. So we're going to log the number of times. We can also have tries. And let's say you get three tries. So you're going to get three tries to do this. And you're going to record your results in this table of times. Now, instead of actually um, going forever, we can now actually have a uh, while tries is less than three here. And if this is an effort, so if this is, if this is where the first try starts, this here is a part of that single, um, hmm, this. So it automatically converts tabs to spaces, this editor. Heads up if you hadn't noticed that before. Okay, so while tries is less than three, you're going to do this. By the way, let me just, um, I'll stop sharing and I'll share again. I wanna make sure that I'm sharing the, yeah, this and not the screen because yeah, the picture on my YouTube stream wasn't that precise. Okay, so here we go. We have, um, we're gonna put the counter inside the loop, but we're now doing this three times. Seemingly this should, this should allow us to do this three times. So counter equals to counter plus one. And maybe we can now add to the list of times, times dot append. Oh, the counter should be set to zero inside this loop as well. So times dot append, um, when you've pressed the counter, the counter should be going on. Oh yeah, I think we're gonna need a loop within a loop actually. So this is that random signal, all right? So the random signal has just started and now we need to actually have a counter. So let's say we, have, we use while true here and then in the while true, we iterate the counter. So now the counter is counting and we're also checking if the button is pressed. And if the button is pressed, we are going to append the current time. So hopefully, if we break out of this after appending the counter, this is going to basically run the reaction time game three times. If this works, it should be relatively easy getting it to display the average and the best time. Hmm, play. Program finished running. Okay. Um, while tries is less than three, three. We haven't set tries, have we? Tries equals to zero. And tries equals to tries plus one. Okay, let's see this now. Oh yeah, that's it. That's a really bad time. Okay, yeah, we need a delay, but that works. The counter needed a sleep 10. We missed that somehow. Okay, so right now it should be accurate. It should work. Yep, 9900s. 26, perfect. So we're running the game three times and we have our tries cataloged in a list. 
And so now that the game is over, because after three times it's going to be done, you can run a forever loop here. That's going to check if button A is pressed and what if button B is pressed and button A and button B could give you the, um, the average and the best time. So if button underscore A dot is underscore pressed, you could display dot show. Or no, I think you need to scroll. And now A could be average. Since it's A, we could say average plus string. And now how do we do it? We could sum up all of the uh, times. So we could say sum of times and divide that by three. Yeah, that should be the average. Now, how many brackets? I think we need two. The only possible downside to this is the floating point number that we produce might have like seven decimal places. Um, I'm gonna assume this is probably correct and just jump to creating the best time. Now the best time should be even easier because if button A is pressed and um, we could display the best time and the best is just the min of times. So this is where really the, the list functions of Python make things easy for us. Okay, uh, EOF, what line? line 26. Did we have too many brackets, too few brackets? What's going on? Too few brackets, I think. One, two, three, one, two, three, yep. Let's run that again. Okay, time, 48, gotta do better than that. 22, oh, it'd be fat. I was gonna say if I could get under 20, but I can't. So now we could press A and that's gonna say the average is 33 with some decimal points. So 33 hundredths and B is best and it's gonna be 22. So there you have it. That's a, you know, fairly compact 25 lines program that not only calculates, you know, your reaction time, but also logs your best time and your average time. Now, maybe before uh, we wrap up, I could show you guys a, uh, a program that I have, uh, you know, I've kind of plagiarized from some students at Kiosk because they came up with this brilliant idea. I'll tell you a little bit about the scenario and then I'll explain the program. I will just bring the slides back. So I need to stop sharing here and microbit webinar full screen. Zoom. Okay. Oh, by the way, before we move on, a very, very interesting thing happens when you attach a speaker to the reaction time. If you attach a speaker, you will find that comparing your reaction with the speaker and without a speaker, there's a dramatic difference. And believe it or not, you react much faster to sound. You know, a lot of kids would anticipate that you react faster to light because light travels a lot faster than sound. But in fact, it's just a brain processing uh, issue. Your brain processes sound nearly instantly, but uh, your brain actually has to construct a three-dimensional uh, model of the world. And it takes quite a bit of a delay, a delay as much as 10th of a second for you to actually genuinely see something. So hearing you're a lot quicker in response. And how much is a lot? Well, about 15 to 20% faster than with light. Okay, now this is the, um, this is a project that really, really illustrates um, how you can basically build what you can visualize and imagine with the microbit in terms of it being a device 
that uses sensing of forces in, in the three dimensions. So in Kiosk, we are running this um, two-day design thinking event. And the premise was that the kids were building a device that's going to help an athlete that sustained a brain injury recover. And we had two examples here. One was like a snowboarder that had a brain injury. Another was a sprinter. And both of them had issues where their actual reactions, reflexes, and strength in the left side and the right side were not equal. And so one, of, one group of students came up with this device, a micro bit where um, a random arrow in a random direction appears. Mm -hmm. And they actually have to push the micro bit in that direction and it logs the reaction time each time. And if you have two at the same time, one in each hand, then you can compare how fast you are reacting with your left hand and with the left visual field and how fast you are with your right hand. So not only do you have the comparison, you get to train making a reaction and making a decision because you actually have to react differently to a different arrow. And I really think, you know, like this is, this is something that could be genuinely useful um, to people that are recovering from an injury and sort of retraining their brain to, towards the optimal function once again. So maybe what I can try to do is show you this program in action. I do have it saved. And if I stop sharing this, and we go into a um, microbit Python. Okay, I'll share the screen now. This is the code for it. So this is a, a random list of arrows, uh, basically northeast, west, and south. And the game is controlled by this sort of game on Boolean variable. And the, the round starts with the microbit generating uh, or selecting a random arrow out of the four arrows. At which point, you have a start time. And once the user shakes the microbit in the correct direction, then you measure that interval between essentially the time when that's happened and the time at which the sort of the, the, the signal started. When you are done, actually you get 10 arrows and when you're done, you get a total uh, average of your reaction and you have the best time. So I've got this micro bit right here and I'm going to upload this program. So I'm gonna download it. Hopefully it's gonna work immediately. I've got the power cable plugged in. And by the way, that link I sent you in the beginning, I'm gonna send you the URL again. I'm gonna to try to react to this in four direction. Ha, ha, ha. And this should be done horizontal. So now that we're done, you could print out best, wow, 6100s. And the average is probably gonna have a lot of decimals. 400, I'm not sure what the average was there, but there you have it. That's a, a really, really cool uh, program. And you have a tutorial. Actually, there will be a tutorial coming up on my YouTube channel on this one. This is my next upcoming one, but I am happy to paste the code in the comments and you guys can copy and paste it into your, into your browser and have fun with it. Now, I'm just going to show you the last couple of uh, slides and I'll open it up to questions. You can send them in by text or if you want to do a video question, just send me a message and I can respond to that now. Um, let's put this thing on. Zoom. Share screen. 
Okay, so this link uh, that's down there is going to have a collection of Microbit Python tutorials. It's going to have the programs for those tutorials, as well as a book that I co-wrote with a gentleman called Nathan Allison that's used in thousands of Australian schools. Um, Basically, it's got Microbit, uh, a collection of tutorials in block code, JavaScript, and Python. The Python versions only got six uh, out of the total 12 programs. We essentially ran out of time towards the end of the project. But yeah, uh, enjoy that. Just checking. So, I will send you that link. Head Start Academy, not just the shortened one. Mm -hmm. Microbit resources. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now that's in the chat. Also, uh, this is the bit.ly for our events in Eventbrite. We're going to have uh, a number of them coming up. I'm actually doing a collaboration with VF Robot, and we're going to have fortnightly microbit based webinars. So they're going to be covering similar stuff to what we're doing now, except we're going to be adding hardware and a number of sensors. I don't know if like where my, yeah. So things like, like the one that I just showed that for example, uses the speakers, mm -hmm. Um, and we're going to be doing projects like um, distributed alarm systems, escape rooms, um, reaction time. This time it's going to involve light and sound together with visualization and a number of others. So that's about it, guys. Um, I'm going to leave this screen on for the next two minutes and I'm going to answer any questions that come in. But otherwise, thank you very much. I hope you had a good time.